We're also very lucky to have Jane Hubbard here with us, Director of Operations at the Legacy of Hope Foundation. Um, we're really honoured to be partnering with them on this campaign. They have years of experience working in the school system and more broadly educating Canadians on the legacy of the residential schools. Um, their 100 Years of Loss kit is used broadly across the country in schools and um, has been taken up by the territories as their core. Um, they've adapted it slightly, but they use it as um, the way to educate grade 10 students on the residential schools. It's a mandatory piece of their education system now. So we have, um, we've really benefited from all the experience of the Legacy of Hope uh, Foundation when it comes to um, putting this campaign together and we're, we're so glad to be working with them on it. So um, Jane's going to tell us more about all of that um, work in the, in the area of education and, um, right. and how we're working together uh, moving forward on, on the, next, the next steps as far as making sure that all Canadians are learning, learning about residential schools, treaties and um, those important contributions both his, historically and uh, today. today. I thought I'd put together a presentation today just uh, to to really introduce the Legacy of Hope Foundation to people who, who don't know uh, who we are and what we do. Um, Jennifer, it was heartening in, in your introduction um, when you talked about uh, asking that question, um, asking people what they know about the issue of residential schools. That's how I always begin um, any of the talks that I do when I go into schools or go into uh, organizations and places of work to discuss this issue. And I'm always surprised when uh, so few hands go up. Um, uh, and it's not just a generational thing because even when I go into schools, uh, we get that same reaction that a, a lot of people uh, haven't been learning about this issue at all. So I'm going to go ahead and share this share the screen and and hopefully technology will be kind to us today and uh, and we can uh, and I can start my little PowerPoint point so uh, who we are so the Legacy of Folk Foundation is a national Aboriginal charitable organization whose purposes are to educate raise awareness and understanding of the legacy of residential schools including the effects the intergenerational impacts on First Nations Inuit and Métis people and to support the ongoing healing process of residential school survivors. It's our hope that by uh, fulfilling this mandate that it will lead to reconciliation amongst generations of Indigenous peoples uh, and also between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. So um, a little bit of history. So Jennifer had touched on the, the RCAP. Uh, we go back a long ways. We've been around for 15 years now. Um, on March 31st, as you can see, um, the Aboriginal Healing Foundation came out of uh, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. So uh, the AHF was created. Um, what it, it was created, it was given ten, a 10 year mandate to disperse a fund of $350 million uh, beginning in 1999, and it was supposed to have ended in 2009. Um, the Aboriginal Healing Foundation has been had provided funding to support community-based initiatives uh, to address the intergenerational legacy of physical and sexual abusing in Canada's Indian residential school system. What uh, one of the major successes of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation was the fact that it encouraged and supported community-based initiatives, and uh, there was a, a large amount of success um, amongst these uh, all of these initiatives because. People really had ownership, and, and they really were community-based. In 2007, there was a, another, uh, an additional disbursement of $125 million uh, for the federal, from the federal government, which extended the life of the foundation to September 2014. Uh, all along, of course, uh, the AHF knew that it would not um, uh, be able to go on in perpetuity, so it set up in 2000, uh, it established the Legacy of Hope Foundation. Uh, the Legacy of Folk Foundation, uh, as I um, had mentioned, its mandate is to raise awareness and, and educate people about the issue of residential schools. I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit here, but, um, but the residential school system and why it matters. We know that um, over uh, 150,000 First Nation, Inuit and Métis children were, as some as young as four years old, were forced to attend um, residential schools. 
we know also that the residential schools were part of uh, a larger uh, government and and uh, and church plan to assimilate uh, the, these kids into the the dominant culture. So we know that also that the children suffered abuses of mind, body, emotions, and spirit that have had a deep and lasting impact on the survivors and their families and and in the communities themselves. So some of the questions that that we've asked and, and how we've sort of and these questions have really sort of driven our work. So why is this matter important to non-Aboriginal Canadians? And why should it matter to someone who's never attended residential school? Well, it matters because it continues to affect First Nations, Inuit and Métis families, who are people from vibrant cultures who are, make vital contributions uh, to Canadian society. It matters also because it happened here in our country, Canada, which is a land considered to be a world leader in democracy. It matters because the residential school system has caused social ills, such as poverty, homelessness, substance abuse, and lateral violence uh, in uh, Indigenous communities. It matters because Indigenous communities continue to suffer levels of poverty, illness, and illiteracy comparable to those in uh, developing nations. So it matters also because we share this land. And we may not be responsible for what happened in the past, but we all benefit from what First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people have had to relinqu relinquish. We are, however, responsible for our actions going forward. So at the Legacy of Folk Foundation, we're very much committed to a candid exploration of Canada's real history. And we believe that education has a huge part to play uh, in the healing movement. And that by creating awareness and encouraging public engagement, as we, we are doing uh, as being a part of the uh, um, Winds of Change campaign, we believe that we can really foster and generate understanding and reconciliation and, uh, and generate a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of pressure as well uh, on governments to, to adopt um, this issue into the curriculum. So just a little bit about the some finer detail as to what we actually do. So um, some people may be familiar with this particular exhibition. This exhibition is uh, the 100 Years of Loss, uh, the Residential School System in Canada exhibition that has toured around um, and appeared at all of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission's national events across Canada. It was developed in 2010, 20, 2011, in conjunction uh, with our uh, 100 Years of Loss curriculum. So the idea, what we did is we would go into, um, we would go into communities before the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, held its national events, and we would uh, talk to teachers and and uh, in service the teachers with the curriculum before the event actually happened so that they could talk and teach their students about the issue of residential schools so that when the students came on education day to visit the exhibition they would have um, a knowledge of the subject matter and uh, and uh, and a greater respect for what they were actually seeing and it goes into some detail that you, you can see there's um uh this particular exhibition is a bilingual English-French mobile exhibition. We say it's mobile. Um, it, it's, a, it, it's a tough one to put up, and we are actually looking to develop um, a smaller scale version of all of our exhibitions so that they re will, real, will be very, very mobile, truly mobile exhibitions. Um, it, it consists of, of eight thematic pods, so that, but four in each language, and there's a wavy wall in the middle that you might be able to see that has a, has a timeline. Um, so the, the second part of the exhibition is the curriculum kit itself, and it's, it's intended to be used as a, an in-class resource, but we found that there were many organizations um, uh, that wanted to, to, to use it as well, uh, you know, non-educators. Um, we had uh, quite a bit of uptake from Corrections Canada as well who wanted to use it uh, with their staff and also uh, amongst the, 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 their inmates as well. So the EDUKIT has uh, the curriculum kit, and it also has uh, uh, five banners, which when put together form a timeline, which is essentially the same timeline in a different format uh, that appears in the, the exhibition itself. We've also made a smaller kit, we call it the teacher bundle, which has a paper uh, accordion fold timeline. We found that the, these other, the education kits themselves were rather unwieldy, uh, 
and expensive to, to ship and to manufacture. So the teacher's guide contains six lesson plans, um, an introduction to Canada's residential school system through the lens of the federal apology. So we start by, by playing uh, Prime Minister Harper or former Prime Minister Harper, uh, his apology in the House of Commons. And there's some discussion uh, afterwards. Um, so what we do is, is when we go in and in-serve as teachers, we take them through that first lesson plan in the book as an introduction to the topic itself. Um, we also look at uh, what happened to create the residential school system. Uh, that takes uh, some historical texts and, and puts the whole system in contact, in historical context. Identity, identity that uh, existed before and then what was taken away in the schools. Life at residential schools, the impacts uh, and the lasting impacts that we're, we're continuing to see today. And, uh, and then we wanted to end the, the curriculum piece on a more hopeful note. So making healing and reconciliation happen. Really what we see uh, the 100 Years of Lost curriculum as is a starting point. We know that this was developed in 2012 and a lot of things have happened since then. Um, one of the things that's happened is that we've gone ahead and done, uh, last year we did an education scan. Some of you may be familiar with that, just to sort of a, a, a checkup to see uh, what individual provinces and territories were doing. Um, there was quite a disparity as to, as to uh, what was happening across Canada. Um, we, uh, uh, number one bullet point there, Nunavut and Northwest Territories, something that was also touched upon uh, by Katie, that they took the 100 years uh, of lost curriculum and adapted it into a northern version, and it is now mandated curriculum for all grade 10 students. Um, they must take that in order to graduate from high school, which is really, uh, it, it's, we think of that as, as being our, our biggest victory so far. Um, uh, the other piece of that is that every teacher in Nunavut and Northwest Territories had been in service uh, in that curriculum, regardless of whether or not they were actually teaching that. So all, all teachers uh, have that knowledge now, which we think is very important also. Um, TRC Education Days, well, those are, those are over, but they were very effective for us uh, in, in uh, bringing uh, the curriculum to teachers across Canada. So we have actually distributed um, 8,689 educates and teachers bundles in both languages and that, that figure was as of yesterday. So um, we have other plans as well to potentially uh, produce it in some sort of digital format. Uh, that remains to be seen of course. Um, 100 Years of Loss is our core piece of curriculum but um, as we're participating, of course, in the Winds of Change campaign, um, we're looking uh, to, to have the Call to Action uh, 62 uh, implemented um, uh, across Canada with early years culturally infused curriculum. So K to 7 will be the, the piece that, that's missing. The 100 Years Lost curriculum is really more uh, targeted um, to uh, older students from 7 to 12. Um, but of course, it's also being used in, in post-secondary. Um, we've worked with Kairos uh, on the Covenant Chain Project for many years now. And uh, one of the reasons why I think we were um, interested in becoming involved with Winds of Change is because uh, we've seen the energy and, in, and the enthusiasm and the effectiveness uh, of, uh, of Kairos and, and what it can do. Um, I think um, there's an astonishing energy and a lot of power uh, in an organization such as Kairos. We know that when we're distributing curriculum, the, the uptake is, is usually um, from, from the bottom up. It's usually from individual teachers. Uh, that's how we've distributed most of our kits. So we're well aware that, that working um, in a, with a grassroots organization makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's one of the reasons that, that we were enthusiastic and wanting to join up with Kairos. Um, I was speaking with Katie as well before we, we, uh, before we went live and one of the, the things that, uh, that I had spoken to her about is that I, I really, in this digital age, you know, um, there's, there's always things that we can do online, which is very exciting. Uh, but at the same time, I think that, that the, um, uh, the, the power of petition, uh, it, it's still very much uh, 
something that people, when they actually sign their signature, they feel as though they've done something. And I think it's a really, um, uh, it's a, it's a really, it allows people to make a statement by, by just signing their signature. I think that's a very powerful act in and of itself too. Um, I just wanted to, to, to close and, and, and quote Margaret Mead and, and, and she says that never doubt that a small group of, of thoughtful committed citizens can make, an, can make a difference. Indeed, um, that's really the only way that change happens. And, and I think that that's what, uh, this is another example of, of, uh, of, of what's going on there. So. And that's really all I have to say. And I'm just going to end with my final thank you. Thanks very much, Jean. Um, yeah. It's nice that like the a lot of the conversations with Legacy of Hope have been the a lot of the conversations with Legacy of Hope have been uh, between staff, and so to be able to broaden that a lot to reach um, many of the other important people in Cairo's board members and um, other partners who are on the call um, today. So yeah, I'm really grateful that uh, you're able to fill us in and um, so that we all have a sense of that strong foundation that we're building on um, the work of Kairos, but importantly the work of Legacy of Hope, all of that work that you've done in the education system and those inroads that you've made in the territories in Nunavut and Northwest Territories is very impressive. So. Um, we do have an opportunity for uh, for a few questions. If um, anyone had questions for Jane or um, Jennifer, after this, Shannon and I are going to go into a little bit more detail about the specific ways you can engage in the pain. So um, you can say there will be a chance to ask questions about that as well. But um, just as a right now, as an immediate response to what you've just heard, um, if you did have any questions regarding that. Uh, can you hear me? May I? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, thank you, Jane. Um, I've I've had the pleasure and privilege of viewing the hundred years of loss exhibit at uh, all of the TRC national events, and so I know how powerful an educational uh, uh, display that that was. Um, so thank you for that, um, and I'm really glad to know that. Uh, you're partnering on the Winds of Change campaign. I did not know that you were also involved with the Covenant Chain, so I'm uh, in contact with uh, Ottawa Anglicans who are very much involved in that, so all, all of this is good for me to hear. Um, I also wanted to mention that the three, I don't know if there were four volumes, but there were three volumes um, that the Healing Foundation produced and I just wanted to lift those up and say how remarkable those volumes were in terms of, edu of being educational resources. Um, talking about the legacy of residential schools, but then also I think volume three was about, um, it involved uh, a lot of artists uh, using uh, poetry and art and other things to express um, uh, the, the impact of residential schools. And um, just, just so you know, because we're together today, um, we uh, we circulate or di we distributed those volumes to the Council of General Synod members, who are our um, governing body members, and they change every three years. And so we've made sure that those council members have always had a copy of those volumes. And so, just to say, uh, the Anglican Church of Canada really does. Uh, deeply appreciate the work of the Healing Foundation and um, and I wanted to mention one more thing if I could. The Anglican Healing Fund, which has been around since 1991, uh, which also um, supports uh, culture and language recovery, a, a lot of that work and increasingly that will be the lar a larger focus in the years to come. Um, what we've tried to do over the years, but it's been a little bit hit and miss, but is to leverage uh, the funding that you've provided over those years when you had that funding um, to communities uh, and uh, um, uh, t toward community groups that are healing from the from residential schools uh, legacy. Um, and we've, we've tried to kind of leverage our healing fund money with that as well. So um, lots of, uh, anyway, you, you're a valuable partner and uh, so I just wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you, and I just wanted to say as well that, that we, we, we do have a special relationship um, with the Anglican Church. We know uh, 
Esther Wesley is a good friend of the foundation, the, both foundations, and um, we're currently actually working right now on a project. Um, uh, thanks to the, the Healing Fund, we're, we're putting together um, workshops and a, um, and a facilitator's guide for those workshops to accompany our um, exhibition called We Were Far Away, which explores the, the unique uh, Inuit experience of residential schools. So, um, okay. yeah, so this is another one of those circular relationships that, that goes back uh, a very long time, too. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Henrietta. Um, there's a question here in the chat um, window. Um, it doesn't have her mic working, but she was curious about the breakdown of the 8,000 educates. Um, like, how, how many went to BC? Oh, I don't have, I, I'd have to pull up my spreadsheets and have a look at those. Um, I, I don't know off, offhand, but I could definitely, I could tell her. Um, I'll find out and let Janet know. Great, thanks. Um, I also wanted to highlight that you have, um, you have something that focuses on the Métis experience of residential schools that's at the um, Human Rights Museum. Right, that I think it is like was. groundbreaking because there uh, isn't much in Canada on that topic. It, it actually did. Uh, it appeared. It had its launch on November uh, the 16th at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. It was only there for a couple of days, and then it went on to Red River College, and will be there till oh, it's it's already gone. It was there till December the 6th, um, and we called it uh, forgotten because really uh, the Métis experience is very different from that of uh, First Nations uh, and, and also, of again, from, from Inuit. Uh, their experiences are all different and very unique. Um, it really was a groundbreaking uh, exhibition, and, and it was actually a very interesting. There, there was some politics involved. Um, there, there were some difficulties some, some, some of the Métis leaders had had with the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. And, and the fact that we were able to actually um, get it in into the museum, uh, there was a lot of, it was a very, um, it was a moment of great reconciliation, let's just put it that way. So uh, it, it was a victory on, on, many, on many levels, actually, having the exhibition there. Um, uh, we're we're actually looking to uh, to tour that exhibition uh, across Canada as well, and with also um, uh, there are workshops that we we've developed, and there's also a facilitator's guide uh, to accompany them as well that's available for people. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, any other questions? Thanks. Um, we wanted to give you a bit of an overview. Uh, this is the first of uh, several meetings like this. We plan to do this monthly, and in the original invitation, Katie outlined uh, the dates for those upcoming uh, updates. Today we'll focus on petitions, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the rest of the actions that we are uh, planning for this campaign. So if you were at um, a workshop, a campaign workshop in the last couple of months, you will have heard that the three components are, that we first planned were paper petitions to all of the um, provincial and territorial uh, governments, um, meetings with MLAs and MPPs across the country. and a mass blanket exercise. Those three were, were mentioned in the original uh, workshops and information. So just to, um, Katie is going to actually pull up our website site and, um, and share that on the screen so that you can see where you can get these various resources and it'll just be a little easier to navigate if you've seen it once. So in terms of the petitions, um, just to clarify again that we uh, knew that if we wanted to submit them in the Houses of Legislature, they would need to be paper petitions. And so if you go to kairoscanada.org 
slash winds of change. Uh, you'll see right now a whole lot more words on the address line, but if you uh, go just to kairoscanada.org slash winds of change, it will bring you to this page. And then if you look at um, the actions a little farther down, along the side you'll see um, the overview, which is the page we're on now, the background, uh, a link to directly to the calls to action that we're responding to, and then the campaign actions. And the first one is sign and circulate the petition. If you go there, you will find um, a separate link for each of the provinces and territories that we have up. Eleven of them are up now, and we hope to have 13 soon. Um, so Katie, I'll just get you to pick a province to show what they look like. And so those of you that have been with us from the start know that we had, um, we had housed these with our resources originally so that the download was a bit more complicated, but this is a direct link. And, um, and petition is on the first page. Uh, a reminder that they need to be uh, single-sided when they're submitted. So um, here you have it. And we hope that you will be uh, passing these links along to your uh, constituency as often and in as many places as you can. And so, you know, we in the office are uh, calling, have, have sometimes called these update meeting, meeting of champions. We hope that you will be the champions of this campaign and will be spreading it far and wide. So that's, that's the petition. I think it's pretty straightforward and those of you that have worked with petitions in the past will, will know that the way to do it is just to take them with you everywhere you go. And every family gathering, every meeting, every uh, public event that you can um, to pass them around, uh, get people to sign, but get people to also to take blank copies on um, to the places that they go. And then the second aspect of this is that um, for, to complete the petitions, we're asking for everyone to have them um, mailed in to us by March 15th, but don't wait for March 15th. We would love to see them now. They have begun to uh, trickle in, and um, we have, uh, you know, assigned a spot, a place to file them away and and hold them until March. And we would like to see the momentum build over the months. And so, definitely, if you have them or if you're giving instructions to people, get people to send them as soon as possible. Uh, that way they don't get forgotten and we get to see the momentum. So then in the spring, we hope that people across the country will be meeting with their MLAs or MPPs and um, we will talk more about this in the February update, but just to let you know that we hope they will happen everywhere regardless of um, the party or um, how close that, that representative is to the issues of education, we hope that all of our legislators will be learning about uh, the importance of Call to Action 62.1 and just the importance of this education and curriculum change uh, so that they can support it in their own constituencies and with their own ministries of education. Um, we are in the process of developing curriculum uh, for a webinar that will happen uh, early in the new year that will be specifically about those meetings. And that will be a public invitation then that we will advertise to our whole network um, for them to come and learn and share wisdom about uh, how to do those meetings in the most productive way and how to uh, then share the findings of those meetings. So I'm going to pass it back to Katie 
to talk a little bit about the math blanket exercise. A little bit about the math blanket exercises. Yeah, um, as Shannon mentioned, there will be different uh, a different focus for each of these monthly updates. So we will have one that um, talks a lot more about the math blanket exercise. For now, we do have it here on the website, but the, you'll see the information there is quite minimal. Um, but there are people in our network, such as Janet Gray, who's on, on the call today on the online with us, who have started organizing um, in Toronto. I know they've started organizing. Um, so this really was inspired by an Indigenous youth organization called Assembly of Seven Generations. They um, some of the, the, those um, youth got involved as blanket exercise facilitators with Kairos. And, and, um, and they, once they experienced it and um, had facilitated it a number of times, they, they felt very strongly that it should be done on Parliament Hill in a, in a large, um, with large numbers of people. So um, they, they worked with us to organize that. They actually had planned to do it in the fall of 2014, um, and then there was the shooting on Parliament Hill, and um, they closed down the hill for a while to events, so it was postponed. And um, then we picked on the next on, a, on an important moment with the TRC having their closing event in Ottawa and releasing their calls to action that we would do it then. And um, many of you, I think, were there and experienced how powerful that was. Um, and it was a nice, I think it was a nice express, uh, expression of our Indigenous rights work and of our work toward reconciliation with the shared leadership between Kairos and an Indigenous youth organization. Um, so we, um, they would like to work with us as well on these, uh, we'd like to hold mass blanket exercises on the lawns of provincial legislatures on the one year anniversary of the, of the uh, close of the TRC, the, um, the release of their, of their findings, um, and to coincide with presenting the petitions to the legislatures, although that will probably happen just before, um, but right around the same time, to be a high point in the campaign and to really make visible the types of education initiatives that we'd like to see in the schools. Um, so, um, so we there will be more information to um, forthcoming on that, um, and we will be providing um, these kind of online spaces um, to to do that planning, and so that we can coordinate across the country and really have a maximum impact. Um, so, so I think that that's all I'll say about the mass blanket exercises for now. Um, but uh, there, in the meantime, for those that are, I, I think everyone on here is very familiar with the blanket exercise, but um, we do have this online resource center, um, kairosblanketexercise.org. So um, there's lots of information on there for facilitators, and there's a link here. So um, some of that information can help people to prepare um, if you're interested in, in being part of the organizing group, if you happen to be living in um, a provincial capital. A provincial ca yeah, feel, um, explore the, our, our, our mini site some more on the campaign. Um, you'll see that there's a report card on there and all sorts of other resources. But the, um, the other action piece that I just wanted to say, but which um, there will be more, more information on future updates, is we're working on a statement that would be an opportunity for organizations to show their support for the campaign. Um, so we have the petitions and the online action for individuals, but uh, we would like to have a statement online and then um, um, organizations, churches, um, school boards, all kinds of groups can put their name to the statement and we can really express um, the kind of collective support that exists for this work. Um, so that, um, that will be ready soon and uh, we can start circulating that to 
get signatures to get um, organizational endorsements. Um, to what degree are the regional networks engaged in this campaign? Do you know? So we have um, we have a, at least one regional representative on the with us today. I believe there are two regional reps. Uh, with us today, Janet Gray from BC, BC Yukon, and Karen Crow, um, who has come in uh, just after we started. Uh, Cambrian Agassiz, she's living in Winnipeg. Um, the regional reps were all at the movement building circle where um, we did outline, we, we did a campaign workshop, and so they, and so they have all been quite um, They've all been well briefed, and the people I've had a chance to have individual conversations with a number of them, and they are working at uh, sending it out to them. Um, in addition to those people, to think back a little bit earlier, this uh, workshop happened at uh, Great Lakes St. Lawrence. It happened in the Prairies North, um, and since there wasn't a regional meeting in the Atlantic, we. I held a, three, a series of three workshops in various cities in, in Nova Scotia in particular um, so that there have had a chance to see it. So we haven't covered every province, but we have been across the country in many places. Okay, I mentioned at the beginning that we had uh, quite a few actions, so we've talked about four out of six that we want to talk about today. And so just to complete that list, the fifth is an online action. When we introduced paper petitions, everyone uh, asked us, will there also be an online opportunity to sign? And the answer is yes. Um, so we don't, again, have all of the details worked out for that at this point. But um, there will be a chance for individuals to sign online, where the statement that uh, Katie was talking about later would be a chance for organizations to put their organizational name behind something. There will be also a, a, a way for individuals to sign in the electronic form. Katie, I'm going to ask if you can um, if you can also pull up the website again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and share that with folks again. And go to the host a workshop page. There's a, and I, I just thought this is new and new on the website and I um, would just uh, share it with you. It's actually a, a link that will be going out in the Kairos Times today. It, um, and so if you can and so if you can scroll down three. So we've listed here five options for public events that can support this campaign. And so you can, you know, in your own newsletters uh, or conversations with people, you can highlight as much as you have space for or, or highlight different ones at different points. So the first one would be a, an Education for Reconciliation workshop, which we have laid out entirely in our action toolkit. Um, and you can find that for free online. Um, another idea is a public event with high profile guests who will publicly sign the petition in the way that you might make a check when you're doing a check presentation. Um, you can just make a massive uh, petition and um, invite the media and make that uh, you know a moment for the cameras, as well as an opportunity to you know have some short speeches or some uh, appropriate entertainment. There are some other options that um, where this can be an opportunity to just have a, an educational event like a blanket exercise or a, a reflecting together workshop, which is. Um, 
kind of a broader perspective. It includes a Bible study and a look at the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, those kind of events can be campaign events when you just conclude with a little bit of information about the campaign and have the petitions available for people to take and for people to sign. Likewise, um, film screenings or book studies. So I just wanted to let you know that that list has gone up and it's something you can link to in your newsletters or encourage people to, um, to try out. And of course, we'd like to hear about things if events are planned and we will post them on our calendar. So that's our, our list of uh, campaign activities. And so with that, I want to turn back to uh, an opportunity for questions, comments, suggestions. I'm wondering how full, how many names you need on a petition before it goes in? Is there a minimum? OK, and, and the other thing I want just to say so you're aware is that uh, Manitoba is uh, introduced their legislation uh, in, for first reading. <clears throat> and we're also uh, in an election cycle for April. And so just if people are working on the Manitoba aspect of it, there's a couple layers of the complication. Uh, one of which is there'll be public hearings around the legislation if it moves forward. And the other thing is that we could be smack dab in the middle of an election campaign uh, right around the time we're trying to finalize those signatures. Paul, oh, can you tell us uh, briefly what the um, what the legislation includes? Uh, I haven't read it yet. I just learned it on Sunday when I was talking about it, and it's, and okay. it's also it's also because it's election time. It's unclear if the opposition is going to resist letting stuff go through so that the government can claim victories on what they've done. So it, the the parliament the legislature is not functioning at its best at the moment. Right. But it was addressing the policy of mandatory education in schools. Okay. So uh, Cheryl McNamara is, is sitting here in the room with me and reminded me that um, an election coming up, as there is in Manitoba and in Saskatchewan in the spring, is a good opportunity for having all candidates meeting and then posing these kinds of questions to the all candidates. and. Um, and getting them into the discussion. I was in a meeting uh, this week of the Ecumenical Working Group on Residential Schools, and um, an interesting point was raised. We were talking about the different recommendations, and one of the members of the of the group, um, who works in communities, Indigenous communities, had just returned from the Yukon, and uh, she was talking about the uh, she was talking about the curriculum in Yukon and saying. Um, while we all down south think this is good, in her experience, things were so isolated in Yukon that this ended up um, kids coming home from school and wanting to talk about this with parents and grandparents opened up a whole new layer of trauma. And um, I'm not saying that to say we shouldn't do the campaign, because I was involved in forming the campaign and think we should do it. Uh, but just that we should be aware of that, that that's a reality in some in some situations. And it was something that I hadn't thought of, and it was a valuable learning. Thanks for sharing, Sarah. These are helpful things for us to keep in mind. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll repeat some of it, because Sarah, Sarah's typing. She wasn't sure that, that uh, people heard it. Uh, she had heard from a, another participant at a meeting that um, in the Yukon, there were, um, when students learned about residential schools in school, they went home to their parents and grandparents and wanted to discuss it and, and opened a whole new level of trauma. Um, so that we hope that that is something that will be built into the curriculum, that there's an awareness among teachers and educators. Um, can I can I just speak to that uh, quickly? Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, for the the curriculum that was developed um, with uh, the northern curriculum that we developed with Northwest Territories and, and with Nunavut, it was really important that that in the fronts piece 
of the, the curriculum that they're being included instructions to uh, teachers and, and to educators who will be using the kit as, as to how to address this in a um, this topic um, in a not in a gentle way because there, there are truths that have to be told but in a respectful way and in a way that wouldn't re-traumatize um, and accompanying uh, the kits before any teachers uh, embarked on um, teaching it to their their students they also uh, there was a letter sent home to the parents so that everyone was aware um, what was going to be taught in the schools before it actually was uh, before it was talked and and it actually opened up some communities community discussions as well so yes there we understand that that, it, that it's a difficult a difficult topic uh, there, there's no doubt about it and um, and that when we're out in community when we're in classrooms teaching it, it can trigger people even if people residential school survivors nor intergenerational survivors uh, themselves a lot of people um, find it makes them feel sad or guilty. Uh, there, there, there really, there really is uh, a responsibility for whoever does teach curriculum and develop the curriculum uh, that that it be done mindfully and 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 with and bearing that in mind. So, um, I just want to say that 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 that, that if, if we have anything to do with the curriculum and I, I think that people are are aware are well aware, uh, hopefully, um, uh, going forward that, that, that there is that danger of re-traumatizing. And I, I think there are ways to do it that, that it won't occur. So it's not, just, uh, it's not just teachers and students uh, that are involved, obviously, as, as you mentioned. It's, it's whole families and whole communities. And so we have to prepare for that in the curriculum itself. Thanks, Jane. Yep. Hi there. Okay, this is Paul. And can I just say that uh, the, the, the call from the TRC and the campaign are also about teaching about treaties and teaching about positive contributions uh, from Indigenous peoples. And so uh, it's really good to be aware of the trauma side of things. But this is also about honoring identity and contribution and history in a positive light. And that's what's in the petition. Can I just make a comment I, just coming to my mind about um, given that we have a few board members on the call, I'm, I'm wondering about some of our, well, our board and uh, being involved in some kind of visible signing process and maybe uh, in, in, that, in, in that screen would do it, um, you know, in a local congregation or in, um, you know, in a gathering of Anglicans. Um, I think that would that would um, be the place to take a little bit of video or some good photographs, and then you could put them on your website, and we'd put them on ours, and highlight what we're doing together. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, my mind is also going about all the number of places that sometimes cross over each other, or where we, or the multiple places in which we find ourselves. I like the idea of the board members and the church leaders. I was also thinking that in uh, um, last week at the Canadian Interfaith Conversation, I facilitated a two-hour session on the TRC call to action 48. Uh, and I can imagine that, um, I'm trying to think, we have a meeting early in the new year. And uh, uh, I can imagine there being recept receptivity at that circle to uh, possibly signing as well and so then we'd get the leaders the national leaders uh, we've got uh, Sunni and Shia Muslim Jewish uh, Baha'i uh, Sikh uh, Christian leaders there and that would also be a kind of a, a it represents an opportunity let me say and I, I could try and work that angle as well hi everybody <laughs> uh, what I was thinking about was uh, in looking at all of the stuff that's come out of churches around uh, COP21, uh, the, the uh, leaders looking like leaders really gets uh, a little bit mind-numbing after a little bit. So a different angle might be to ask 
each level of the Kairos network to sign, sign in front of a group of, uh, of children and uh, leaders and board members, but circle members and movement like, have the emails go out wide. But uh, those images with the kids will be a unique twist. So kids can't sign the petition. But um, it does make it more interesting. And uh, uh, of all of the things that people are being asked to do right now, that does inspire them to go find a community to do it in. So um, it doesn't have to be, but it's a, a thought about how to get people to do something we might pay more attention to and get more signatures from. Thanks, Karen, for that idea. Raising that kids can that there's no um, there's no age limit on petition signing in Ontario. Should confirm with the other provinces, but um, that could be a great way to engage people of all ages, kids um, standing up for their rights. Hi, yeah, it's Catherine. Just yeah, I, I was just on the Ontario's web page, and it and it did say that um, you didn't you don't need to be of the age of majority to, for it to be legally recognized. All you have to do is have your name printed, your your address, an Ontario address, and a signature. That's all that's required. Okay, thanks for checking that. It may be different from province to province. Henriette here. Um, I remember when the Housing for All uh, campaign was on, and um, it's also important for anyone who is delivering petitions to uh, MLAs, MPs, or uh, provincial legislatures uh, to make sure that the photo opportunity is, uh, is used. I see that there are a lot of things coming in on the chat, uh, some of them overlapping. and. So we, if we don't answer your question or refer to your comment directly, know that we will go back and read them and uh, do our best to respond to those different um, comments and questions even after that our call has finished. I just want to pick uh, up on Janet. Yeah, uh, I was going to say to she. Yeah. So there's two uh, two answers I would give um, to Janet. One is that, you know. We're finding that there's strong words in lots of places, but implementation is a, a more of a challenge, right? And uh, there are aspects of this process uh, where we can see, for example, that there is residential schools uh, related education in a particular grade level, but we're not getting the other pieces and we're not getting them mandatory or across the spectrum. So I think really we're going to need to have to push on the implementation side once we once we have actually achieved getting the words that we are looking for uh, everywhere. And we're beginning to see those words, but we're, we're, um, implementation is the, it would be the key. Um, the other thing, though, I, is that because we see this in that broader context of winds of change, we're really talking about, well, what are the other um, parts of the uh, 94 calls to action that we would, that would make sense for us to layer on in the next year. And the one that um, seems to kind of dovetail with this and makes a lot of sense uh, for us, again, and our constituency might be um, 93, which is the one on newcomer education. So if we're focusing on mandatory curriculum in the schools, the other people who are you know, new to the Canadian public school system are uh, uh, refugees and migrants and immigrants to Canada, and what? How is this? These issues and these questions dealt with in terms of they dealt with. Well, just to say that it, it makes some sense to layer it on uh, to say we are trying to get coverage of the entire country, right? So how do we do that through schools, but also through new? Now, of course, there are other specific calls to action that we're working on in different ways, but I'm talking about this from the perspective of kind of entry-level mass campaigning. Um, we are working on 48, uh, all of us hopefully together, uh, in our different ways, which is around the UN Declaration 
Um, we put a statement on our site yesterday to, to respond to the missing and murdered inquiry. That's another one that we obviously are, are working on. Um, and we'll continue to pick up specific uh, pieces of the calls to action. But just in terms of layering on something else, I think that's, that might be our next opportunity. And I, I really like that because um, in the Canadian Interfaith Conversation Circle last week, Imam Patel, who has been a, a Muslim leader in Canada for a good 20, 25 years, um, you know, at the beginning of the session, he said, well, you know, we're working with a lot of newcomers. And then as we began to look at the idea of treaty peoples and how privileges and, and uh, resources and rights are that, that newcomers enjoy are, um, are uh, at, they come at a cost uh, and that that whole area some redress. Um, by the end of that, there was uh, quite a bit of enthusiasm, especially by the two Muslim leaders who were in the, in the room, um, given the influx of Syrian refugees um, that, that will really um, sort of bump the numbers in Canada, that that they could get behind this and that they saw that this was an important thing. So I think give this year, uh, it, or given um, uh, 2016 as a time for um, the, their faith leaders to get around this, um, I, I really like the idea that there be a transition to, um, uh, did you say 63? Or whichever, yeah, 63. Okay, anyway. I like that. Thank you. So I just wanted to check because uh, I think I heard something about delivering petitions. And as I recall, the strategy was to make sure the petitions went to Kairos first before they got delivered. And just so we're clear about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Paul, thanks for highlighting that. We are asking for all petitions to be at the Kairos Toronto office by March 15th. And then we will. Uh, collate them by province and territory, and we will send them back to our volunteers as a group from the whole province um, so that they can be presented all at once um, in that provincial legislature. Okay, I think we've probably come to about the end of our time here. Um, if you have further questions, certainly don't hesitate to contact myself or Katie um, or other staff that you're in conversation with at Kairos. I um, wanted to highlight that our next update will be Thursday, January 14th, again at 1 o'clock. So that's the second Thursday in January at 1 o'clock. This is a pattern that we hope to keep so that it'll be easy to remember when these updates are happening. We will have a guest speaker again and um, uh, sort of one a bit longer guest speaker and then another speaker who can give us an inspiration from the field, a story from within our network that will show how the campaign is being carried out. Um, uh, this next month on the organizational statement that Katie mentioned that um, so a place where groups um, be they unions or federations or um, organizations can publicly put their name behind um, seeing this curriculum change across the country. So that's January 14th. And for now, I just want to thank very much uh, Jennifer Henry and particularly Jane Hubbard for coming and presenting to us and telling us more about the Legacy of Hope and to all the rest of you for participating and being with us. Thanks again and a Merry Christmas to everyone and we will see you in the new year. Thank Merry you, Shannon. Christmas. Thank you. And everyone. And